This video contains elements that are not suitable for children under the age of 14. Viewer discretion is advised. With the 75th anniversary of Thomas and Friends having gone by, as well as reports of the show being revamped yet again, I've decided to give a retrospective on all 24 seasons of the show thus far, from its humble beginnings in 1984 all the way to 2020, between December of this year and February of next year. In case you're wondering, I won't be talking about the specials or the Jack in the Pack spinoff, because for now, I'm going to talk about the main show itself and see how well each season holds up. Before we begin, I should state that some opinions regarding certain episodes are bound to be controversial, but please keep in mind that each review is entirely opinion based. If you want to give your own thoughts as to why you agree or disagree in the comments, that's fine. I know I've already done seasons 21 and 22 for the Emotions Corner, but I'm re-reviewing them solely for my own personal views, and also to see whether or not my views back then hold up now, especially since they aired a few years ago. Also, rather than I'm reviewing them episode by episode, because I make these reviews way longer than I want, I'll instead be talking about the nuts and bolts as to see what makes these seasons good or bad, as well as the history surrounding the franchise during that time. If you want to know what I think about each episode individually, I'll leave a link to a Google document for that in the description below. But if there is an episode you feel that I didn't fully elaborate on, don't hesitate to tell me and I'll try to clarify as best as I can. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Zach Wanzer, and this is Solarama. Our story begins back in 1979 when Britt Alcroft met with Reverend Wilbert Audrey on the Bluebell Railway. Audrey was being interviewed for a feature on steam engines and Alcroft had read some of his books prior to the interview, becoming fascinated with the likes of Thomas, James, and Percy and wants to make a television series off of the books, despite Audrey's initial skepticism. Though who could blame him, especially since previous attempts to get the books made into a show had failed. The first attempt at a televised adaptation was done by the BBC on June 14, 1953 based upon the sad story of Henry. Directed by Douglas Bear and narrated by Julia Lang, the pilot was a dismal failure, especially when the model used to represent Henry derailed at a set of points and a crew member's hand put it back on the rails. The negative media was so great that the series was quickly cancelled and the footage, sadly, no longer exists. The second attempt was planned to be a musical television series directed by Brian Crosgrove and written by Andrew Lloyd Webber, known for his work such as Jesus Christ Superstar and Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Lloyd Webber approached Kagan Ward in 1973 with the proposal, and by 1976, the pilot episode was produced, believed to be in the style of another show about a sentient locomotive, Ivory the Engine. But sadly, by the following year, it had been cancelled due to a lack of interest, and with the success of the musical Evita, Lloyd Webber stayed in the music theater business, later producing hits such as Cats, The Phantom of the Opera, and Starlight Express. Lloyd Webber had formed a really useful group inspired from the phrase really useful engine, and his 1984 hit musical, before mentioned Starlight Express, was inspired by the railway series as a whole, showing that even though his television show didn't get off the ground, he still loved the books. And yes, I know, there was another attempt in the 1970s on the children's show Jack and Harry, with the books read by Ted Ray, but I don't count that because they're straightforward retellings rather than taking a few liberties here and there. I only bring it up because you'll likely comment about it if I didn't. Anyway, the third and most successful attempt thus far was from Britt Alcroft in 1984, following a pilot in 1983 based upon Down the Mine, which was later refilmed to become the penultimate episode of the first season. While its stage is unknown, it can be said that it was well received enough to justify a full-fledged series. A production crew was soon rounded up including director David Mitten, music composers Mike O'Donnell and Jr. Campbell, and narrator Ringo Starr, best known for being the drummer for the Beatles. It's funny to think now that at the start of the decade, his music career was floundering, and it wouldn't be till the end of a decade that interest in seeing him play music would be revived. Yeah, let's face it. The first half of the 80s were pretty rough for the former Beatles. John Lennon was murdered just as his career was restarting. Paul McCartney seemed to be spinning his wheels after he put out Tug of War. George Harrison's career went nowhere in England despite a semi-Beatles reunion reaching the top 10 in America. And Ringo's music career was put on an indefinite hiatus when Old Wave barely made it out of Germany and Canada. Good luck finding a copy of Adam or Stop and Smell the Roses. But I digress. Thomas is a tank engine who lives at a big station on the island of Sodor. He's a cheeky little engine with six small wheels 
a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy boiler, and a short stumpy dome. The first season of the show premiered on October 9th, 1984, and all stories with the exception of Thomas's Christmas Party were adapted from the first eight books of the Railway series. The first four books were adapted in their entirety, with Edward's Day Out and Edward and Gordon from the first book merged together for Edward and Gordon, and James and the Top Hat and James and the Bootlace from the third book merged to become James and Coaches. The only stories not adapted for season one were Henry and the Elephant, Percy and the Trousers, Mrs. Kindly's Christmas, Leaves, and Paint Pots and Queens. With the exception of Mrs. Kindly's Christmas, all were eventually later adapted for seasons 3 and 4, which we'll cover later. Meanwhile, Gordon's Whistle and Henry Sneeze, both from Henry's book, were merged together to form Whistles and Sneezes, which means that 28 out of the original stories were adapted into 25 episodes, rounded out with Thomas's Christmas Party, and you got yourself a 26 episode season, which would set the standard for future seasons to come. So, how did the episodes of the first series stack up? Well, I think it's safe to say that for the most part, they are incredibly faithful adaptations of the original stories, but compared to later seasons, the episodes of season 1 will come off as a bit low-key and, well, bland. Right out of the gate, I'm gonna throw some unpopular opinions out there, but visually, season 1 hasn't aged very well. They're not awful or anything, but if you compare the visuals of the first seven episodes to what The Avenger Begins has to offer, season one does feel a bit simple. Story-wise, Edward and Gordon is kind of boring if you compare it to season 18's old reliable Edward. The latter just has a certain something that the former just can't compete with. Now granted, we do get entertaining moments throughout the first series. Inspector, he whispered, can you see fish? <laughs> And we get amazing episodes like Thomas and the Breakdown Train, Dirty Objects, and Thomas and Birdie, but they tend to be the exception as opposed to the rule. While I'm on the subject of unpopular opinions, out of the first series episodes, the sad story of Henry and the Flying Kipper have probably aged the worst. Let me put it this way, if you want to know what Audrey thought about Henry, I think these two episodes are solid proof of that. In the former, he wanted to keep Henry bricked up in the tunnel forever, but the publishers insisted on a story bringing him, Edward, and Gordon together to create a happy ending. While they had the right idea in retrospect, unfortunately, Henry became this albatross that would frustrate Audrey to no end during the first six books. No thanks to C. Reginald Dalby, someone who didn't really care about trains, and he practically became the problem child of the main cast. If later episodes that we'll get to soon enough or anything to go by. In the books, Henry was repainted blue, resulting in young children mistaking him for Gordon, most infamously in an illustration of Thomas and the Guard. For TV, Henry stayed green, presumably because of budget, but mostly so he was easier to identify, and so Audrey repainted him back to green for troublesome engines, but Vanny got questions as to why Gordon was repainted, so Audrey decided to alter Henry's shape for good in The Flying Kipper. Earlier, he wanted to quietly kill off Henry because of steaming problems, but fan power proved persistence, and Henry was here to stay. But I'm gonna say it, the Flying Kipper is greatly overhyped by the fandom. Visually, I can understand why people would love it. The atmosphere is great, the visual shots are stunning, and the music probably helped too. But the story is everyone what talks about last. Or is it the lack thereof? Much like Legend of Zelda Mahora's Mask, one of the greatest games for the Nintendo 64, people forget that the gameplay is why you bought it, and the story is more or less the reason people want to watch a Thomas and Friends episode. The Flying Kipper is just the journey of a steam engine that happens to be sent here pulling a train before it crashes. That's it. I want to talk about the narration next. If you were to talk to anyone who grew up watching Thomas and Tank Engine, Ringo Starr's role as the narrator will inevitably follow. He wasn't even aware of the books while growing up, but a baby with Audrey changed his tune and he signed on to the role. According to an interview with TVAM, just as the show was kicking off, it took eight days, basically a week, to record the entirety of the first series, and I included retakes for four episodes due to the tone in his voice. Looking back on his narration, Ringo sounds a lot more like he's reading a bedtime story, and that went better with some Ladybird audiobooks that he did, and his voices with the characters barely sound distinct from each other. Well done, Percy. You started so quickly that you stopped a nasty accident. I'm sorry I was cheeky, said Percy. You were clever to stop. James, he asked, why are you red? I am a splendid engine, answered James, ready for anything. You never see my paint dirty. Oh, said Toby innocently, that's why you once needed bootlaces to be ready, I suppose. Hello, Henry, said Edward, you look splendid. I was pleased to hear your happy whistle yesterday. Thank you, Edward, smiled Henry. Shh, shh, can you hear something? It sounds like Gordon, said Edward, and it ought to be Gordon. 
That being said, there's still a bit of fatherly charm to be found in his narration, and organically, he sounds better in the United Kingdom than he does in the United States. I mean, if you listen carefully, you can hear when a line was recorded in 1984 and in 1989 to suit American audiences with Shine Time Station. This also applies to Series 2, which we'll cover next time. Here's a couple of examples for Thomas and Gordon, or Thomas Gets Tricked. He loves playing tricks on them, including Gordon, the biggest and proudest engine of all. Thomas likes whistling rudely at him. Wake up, lazy bones. Why don't you work hard like me? He loves playing tricks on them, including Gordon, the biggest and proudest engine of all. Thomas likes to tease Gordon with his whistle. Wake up, lazy bones. Why don't you work hard like me? Hurry up, you, said Gordon. Hurry yourself, replied Thomas. Gordon began making his plan. Yes, said Gordon, I will. And almost before the coaches had stopped moving, Gordon reversed quickly and was coupled to the train. Hurry up, you, said Gordon. Hurry yourself, replied Thomas. Gordon, the proud engine, began making his plan to teach Thomas a lesson for teasing him. Almost before the coaches had stopped moving, Gordon reversed quickly and was coupled to the train. Even the ending dialogue is altered. And had a long, long drink. He went home very slowly and was careful afterwards never to be cheeky to Gordon again. And had a long, long drink. Maybe I don't have to tease Gordon to feel important, Thomas thought to himself. And he puffed slowly home. I can understand lines being changed as an American viewer, like myself, would be more familiar, for example, with the term freight car as opposed to truck, and to avoid people with the term fat controller. But why were lines with the aforementioned examples altered? It wasn't like troublesome trucks or fat controller were ever mentioned, though probably the most jarring example would have to be the aforementioned sad story of Henry, or Come Out Henry, where the dialogue was changed up to make the story's context easier to understand so they could predict what would happen next. Eventually, even the fat controller gave up. We shall take away your rails, he said, and leave you here for always and always and always. They took up the old rails and built a wall in front of him so that Henry couldn't get out of the tunnel anymore. Eventually, even Sir Topham Hatt gave up. We shall take away your rails, he said, and leave you here until you're ready to come out of the tunnel. They took up the old rails and built a wall in front of Henry so that other engines wouldn't bump into him. Sutton dirt from the tunnel had spoiled his lovely green paint and red stripes anyway. He wondered if he would ever be allowed to pull trains again. But I think he deserved his punishment, don't you? Sutton dirt from the tunnel had spoiled his lovely green paint and red stripes anyway. How long do you think Henry will stay in the tunnel before he overcomes his fear of the rain and then decides to journey out again. I think it would have made much better sense if Ringo had re-recorded the episodes from the ground up just so the difference wouldn't be so jarring. Listening to George Carlin's narrations, however, they flow a lot more naturally in the American dub than Ringo's partial re-narrations, but still like such of this was whistles and sneezes, which remained unknown in America until George would take over as Mr. Conductor. It isn't wrong, chuckled Henry, but we just don't do it. Series 1 was the only series of the entire show's history to be filmed at Clapham Junction and Clearwater Studios in Battersea. From the second series all the way up to the 12th, the show would be filmed at Shepperton Studios. It's a bit like living in the town you were born in the first couple of years of your life before living the rest of your childhood all the way up to your adulthood in another. That's not a hyperbole there, I should know. Some scenes for certain episodes were filmed alongside others. As an example, the first scene from Troublesome Trucks and one of the scenes from Tenders and Turntables, both of which took place at Tidbiff Sheds, were filmed alongside each other. While we don't know the order of the production for the episodes, it can be assumed that the final set made for filming was Toby's Old Tramway, which would explain why the majority of the Series 1 promotional images take place there. Presumably, Toby and the Stout Gentleman was one of the last episodes to be produced along with B-roll footage of Thomas with Annie and Clairville that was later reused for a couple of Series 3 episodes as as well as several music videos, not to mention B-roll footage featuring Percy pulling two vans in the brake van that was featured in the Island song. 
The models of the engines each required a Berkeley chassis, as well as made for the original pilot models of Thomas and Gordon were unreliable. The model of the Fulber appears for one shot in Down the Mine, likely reused footage from the pre-production pilot. The bodies were made from perspex, and fittings such as buffers and brake pipes were provided by Tenbill, who also provided the models for most of the rolling stock. Markland even provided one of her own engines for background use, as well as some of the track alongside Tenbill. The engines were based upon the original C. Reginald Delby illustrations, as were the majority of facial expressions, first being sculpted in clay and then a silicone mold would be made and then cast in smooth through molding and casting again, and then the final face would be painted. In some cases, faces were duplicated in case the crew needed a face to be both dirty and clean on the same day of shooting. Uniquely, Henry's model was built with the ability to be changed either into his old shape or his new shape since, as mentioned earlier, Series 1 was filmed out of sequence. And while the splashes were removed for his new shape to resemble Black 5 as best as they could, weirdly, they returned to Series 2, making him resemble some kind of Jubilee Patriot hybrid. Why couldn't they keep the splashes off for future seasons? All in all, as far as the first series goes for Thomas the Tank Engine, it's pretty solid overall. For just about nearly every show in existence, the first series is not always going to be great and will have imperfections that are likely to get ironed out over time. Thomas is of no exception to this. The visuals with the models will come off as dated compared to CGI aesthetic of the current seasons, and the episodes are more or less verbatim retellings of the original books, but they still set the tone for the show overall, and it would eventually go on to last for over 30 years. It may not be the greatest thing put out to mankind, but I say it's worth checking out if you're just getting started with the franchise. Both production and story-wise, a lot had changed in the previous series. For one, the production team moved from Clapton Junction westward to Shepperton Studios, where they would continue filming until Series 12 in 2008, which we'll get to later in the marathon. Not only that, with the first series being a financial success, the second series had a bigger budget this time around, which meant that we had sets such as Brendam Harbor, as well as Tidbiff and Crosby stations. It even introduced many popular characters, including Duck, Diesel, Bill and Ben, Harold, Trevor, Donald and Douglas, Daisy, and Boko. Alongside the production values, the storytelling was a step up in the previous series. While the first series was simpler and focused on the characters, the second series was a bit more complex and focused on a lot of action. Chases, races, runaways, and rescues. Some of the more memorable moments of the series come from episodes like A Close Shave, Old Iron, and Edward's Exploit. Even back in the 80s, Thomas and Friends was a children's show, but was never afraid to take risks such as the on-screen death of a character or having the spooky atmosphere for one of their stories. With five exceptions, the episodes were largely adapted from various books from the entirety of Edward the Blue Engine all the way up to the first half of Tramway Engines. Some of the books in between were later adapted for the third and fourth series, which we'll get to next time, and one more eventually being adapted for CGI in Series 20. As of 2017, only Mountain Engines and Very Old Engines have not been adapted for TV in any capacity. The aforementioned five exceptions were all adaptations of Christopher Audrey's stories, three of them coming from the 30th book of the Railway series, more about Thomas the Tank Engine. And I'm going to be perfectly honest here, Christopher's stories pale in comparison to his father's. What do I mean by that? That? Well, it's difficult to explain. The Soda Island Forms blog has done a post giving their insight onto the Christopher era, but to try and make a long story short, the stories come off as a bit bland and events within happen to characters rather than them creating their own events. For example, in Percy and the Signal, the little green caterpillar with red stripes plays jokes on Gordon and James, and the big engines get their own back at him by telling him about backing signals. Pop Goes the Diesel has Duck telling Diesel to fetch his trucks for him, and in an attempt to show off, Diesel makes a complete fool of himself and vows revenge and dirty work in Thomas Comes to breakfast, Thomas is overconfident that he thinking he can drive off on his own, but the actions of a careless cleaner prove otherwise. Meanwhile, there's the runaway, which Thomas returns in the works with a stiff handbrake, and then when the relief fireman forgets, Thomas becomes well, a runaway. It's not driven by Thomas being impatient and it comes back to haunt him. It just happens to him because it does. Willard based the majority of his stories on real life events and it would often happen to characters in order to teach them something by the end. And that's where the criticism of Christopher's books come from. It doesn't help that many of them, especially in the 90s, featured Thomas very heavily, no doubt influenced by the TV series. On the whole, more about Thomas' tank engine simply feels like a filler book. No major development happening on Sodor, nor is there a new engine arriving to potentially shake up a dynamic somewhere. It's a book that just exists so Birdie and Hale could get roles in episodes like Better Late Than Never or The Runaway. 
and to give Thomas more roles, I reckon. Heck, Christopher hasn't spoken very kindly about the book as it had been written in a rush just to meet a deadline. Christopher's greatest strength in his writing would have to be in the annual stories like Thomas and Trevor, or standalones like Thomas and the Missing Christmas Tree, both of which were adapted for this season because they don't have to deal with major story arcs like a railway series book does. Now to give Christopher credit where it's due, he does write the odd good book like Really Useful Engines and Toby Trucks in Trouble, but no matter what, they'll always be in the shadow of Wilbert's writing. With series 2, what I would have done is taken out 4 of Christopher's stories, Missing Christmas Tree still sing as the finale, and instead replaced them with more of Wilbert's stories, which brings me on to the next point of discussion. There were pretty big plans for series 2, but because of the 26 episode limit, a fair number of stories had to be cut. Percy's Promise and Double Header were both candidates, but they were instead pushed back to become part of series 3, the latter of which was called Time for Trouble for some reason. Going Goes Foreign was another candidate, but it was cancelled altogether because it would have been incredibly expensive to produce, though it did end up being told by Mr. Perkins for Thomas's YouTube World Tour segment and got a reference in Thomas and the Royal Engine. I know the way to London after all, and have been there before, you know. <laughs> Not the station names again, Gordon. I just wish they would make up their minds on what to call London Station. But perhaps the most infamous removal from Series 2 was the first part of Donald and Douglas' saga, The Missing Coach. During production, the model crew had gotten to the point of filming scenes at Tibbet Station, with Thomas arriving before Bert Alcrock decided to scrap the episode altogether, citing that there was a lack of action and that the storyline would have been too confusing for younger viewers to follow. With hindsight, I would call Boiler Sludge on that, because she also died of a diesel which had a similar premise with Bill and Ben, as well as a few other episodes in this series alone where didn't have much action for four and a half minutes. Hypocrisy much? And before you get on my case, let me just say that I have a great deal of respect for Britt Alcroft in general. After all, she was the one who helped introduce Thomas to the world, and she certainly deserves her place in the franchise's history. But with all that said, and it will be brought up quite a few times this marathon, there were times when she didn't seem to understand the world that Wilbur Audrey first created. For the past decade or so, fans have been recreating how the missing coach might have gone had it actually been adapted for television, so I provided a few links below to provide some examples. I'll also link both parts of Nick Starwin's take on his legendary status as a lost episode, and I think he can explain it way better than I could. But for all my issues of a lot of episodes being cut altogether or later readapted for the next two series, I believe that story-wise, Series 2 is about questioning the best of the classic era. I mean, it's just gem after gem. Old Iron, the Duck and Diesel trilogy, Thomas Comes to Breakfast, Edward's Exploit, Ghost Train, the list goes on and on. But I think that if you remove the adaptations from more about Thomas the Tank Engine and replace those with more of Wilbert's stories, maybe hold back Percy Takes the Plunge for Series 3, then Series 2 would probably be perfect, or at least near perfect. I even linked to you my personal take on that below. Series 2 was the last to feature Ringo Starr as the narrator, and compared to Series 1, he had a lot more energy, most likely down to the fact that he had a resurgence of popularity. By the time he had stopped drinking in 1988, this newfound popularity was forever affirmed by appearing in the first season of Shining Time Station the following year, shortly followed by a renewed interest in his music career, and even at the age of 80, he's showing no signs of slowing down. Although Ringo's time with Thomas was short-lived, people speak very positively about his time with the franchise, and while in retrospect there have been other narrators after him with greater enthusiasm, he really set the tone for the show. That being said, there's a lot of debate as to who was the better narrator for the first two series, Ringo or George Carlin. Don't worry guys, I'll be talking about our modern man when we get to series 3, and I will decide for myself who narrated series 1 and 2 better. So overall, is series 2 the best of the show? Well, so far we're only two episodes in, but right now, I'd say it is better than the first series. Anything I could say for closing thoughts, I probably already said earlier in this review, but it's going to take a lot to beat this series in terms of quality. We'll see where it goes in the future, but for now let's Move on. Shh, shh, shh. Do you hear that? It's the winds of change. The 1990s were a pretty quiet decade in the real world, at least compared to the three decades prior. Between the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the 9-11 terrorist attacks, save for perhaps the odd military conflict like the Gulf War, not a lot really happened in this decade. Media, on the other hand, had a lot going for it. The Simpsons, Ren and Stimpy, Rugrats, Wayne's World, Bill and Ted, Beavis and Butthead, Animaniacs, Batman the Anime Series, the Disney Renaissance, Mr. Bean, Seinfeld, and of course, Thomas the Tank Engine. 
1989, the franchise was finally brought to America on PBS via Shining Time Station, which would be the first time that Thomas shared a network with the likes of Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street. In the show, Ringo Starr reprised his role as storyteller for the series, as well as landing the role of Mr. Conductor, a friendly 18-inch tall man with magic powers. As mentioned with Series 1, a few bits of dialogue were redubbed to suit American audiences, but they didn't flow as well as Ringo's UK narrations or George Carlin's narrations. It would have made better sense, as I said, to re-narrate the episodes from the ground up. Ringo Ringo assumed to part the role of Mr. Conductor in 1990, following the TV special Tis a Gift to resume his music career with the All-Star Band and his 1992 album Time Takes Time, and the role was taken over by George Collin for the remainder of the show's run, right after the spin-off Mr. Conductor's Thomas Tales and the hour-long family specials. Not long after the show's end, seasons 2 and 3 would continue to run syndicated airings on Fox Family in 1998 and 99, and Nick Jr. during the summer of 2000. The latter airing was to wrote a certain movie about a certain railroad that had received a polarized reputation over the years. As for Shine Time itself, the show was positively received, but I don't know if it holds up to be honest. I know I must have seen the show on PBS, but I don't remember much of it, only that the Thomas stories were used as a sort of framing device to provide lessons to the kids. All I can say right now is that, with retrospect, I think Shine Time Station is partly responsible for causing the eventual demise of the Thomas franchise. Not the direct cause, mind you, just a small part of the bigger picture. With Ringo's departure, a new narrator had to be found for both the United States and the United Kingdom. For the former, it was George Carlin, as I mentioned previously, well known for his stand-up comedy routines. Yep, that George Carlin. Rat shit, bat shit, dirty old twat. 69 assholes tied in a knot. Hooray, lizard shit, fuck! <laughs> How someone with one of the dirtiest ever mouths end up on a children's show like Thomas the Tank Engine remains a mystery to the ages, but with that being said, it showed a different side to him that not many would see beyond his comedy routines. He even spoke very fondly of the franchise and even helped forever his career until his death in 2008. He even referenced his time as Mr. Conductor in his 1999 special, You Are All Diseased. And I know what you're thinking, you say, Jesus, he's not going to attack children, is he? Yes, he is. <laughs> he's going to attack children. And remember, this is Mr. Conductor talking. I know what I'm talking about. And as for who they brought in for the British dub, well, let me take a page from Gandalf's book by introducing you to him. His name's Nigel. Dr. Nigel Botterill. I'll get you the details. Personally, I grew up in the United States, so obviously I have a lot of nostalgic fondness for George Carlin. I didn't hear of Michael Angelis until getting New Friends for Thomas on VHS when I was 9, and the narration I heard from him, I enjoyed. Thanks to YouTube, we can now enjoy Angelis' narration for as much as we like. If I had grown up in the United Kingdom, Angelis would probably have been number one for me, and he's probably the most undervalued narrator the show's ever had. The fact that he was following up on someone who was part of the biggest band in the world meant that he had big shoes to fill. It's a shame that Michael Angelis died earlier this year. I guess you never know what you really had until you lost it. Now what can I say about the episodes themselves? Well, for the first time, a series is not 100% based on oddly written material. No, they adapted some magazine stories by Marvel Comics originally written by future head writer Andrew Brenner. One of the reasons that Britt Alcroft and David Bitten resorted to adapting magazine stories and writing a couple of original stories, these being All at Sea and Thomas and Percy's Christmas Adventure, was because many of the stories yet to be adapted featured a large quantity of new characters which would have been expensive to produce. Not to mention they wanted more stories about Thomas and other previously established characters. The adaptations from the Railway series were generally pretty faithful to the original stories, with liberties taken here and there. Though probably the worst and most pointless adaptation of Series 3 was The Trouble with Mud. Seriously, what was up with that? Mind my eyes, he grumbled. That being said, Audrey was pretty unhappy with how loosely adapted his stories were, and was even critical toward the original episodes for their apparent lack of realism. The most infamous example being Henry's Forest particularly this bit. We've made good time today. We'll stop for a while by the forest. What responsible driver would stop as if he was in a roadside lay-by? You can't do it. They've shown a lamentable ignorance of Rule 55. I'm sorry, but that's a lot of rubbish. Episodes like Wooly Bear have broken Rule 55 and Audrey never got upset over that. And some of you are probably wondering, what the hell is Rule 55? Rule 55 is a protection of of trains when they come to a stand, they remind you of the signalman of the position of your train, sending your fireman within a minute, two minutes to the signal box to uh, sign the book and ensure that the signalman is aware of your position on the track. That's, that's Rule 55. 
I think he was only really critical towards Henry first because he personally disliked the Green Engine himself, not to mention being based on a story that neither he nor Christopher wrote. Oh, and as for engines being interested in scenery, Garrett explained why Thomas Goes Fishing exists, in which Thomas had an interest in going fishing? Answers on a postcard, please. That being said, if there was anything series free provided, the show does not need to solely depend on audio written material to be good. I mean, most of Christopher's books aren't really that interesting compared to what his father wrote. Not meant to be a knock on him, of course, and I don't know if any children from the 1990s would have been interested in something like Pop Special or Foaming at the Funnel. This impact would be felt in Series 5, which we'll get to soon enough, and from that point onward, they stuck with original content save for The Adventure Begins and free episodes in Series 20. For the most part, the episodes are pretty solid overall, with a nice range of characters like Diesel making his return as a recurring antagonist, as well as the introduction of Dolliver, Toad, Mavis, and Bulgy. Out of him, I probably like Oliver the most because of how fascinating his backstory is. He tried running away from Scrap just to survive, and he and Toad managed to find sanctuary on Sodor thanks to Douglas. Oliver then gained an ego when the big engines gave him respect for his bravery, but he was soon humbled following an incident with a turntable, and later got back at the trucks by pulling their leader Scruffy apart, even though that happened in the next series, but still. Just a shame that despite being in CGI, Oliver rarely made any appearances, but at least it's still more than what he ever got in Christopher's books. The other newbies for Series 3 are still great characters as well, with Mavis going through a really good character arc by starting off as a bit of a rebellious, hot-headed teenage girl to a more mature, motherly figure from Series 6 onwards, and it's still carried over into CGI. In fact, Mavis is probably one of the few characters that no one's managed to screw up, which is amazing. Toad and Bulgy I didn't think much of until they were brought back in CGI, and other among the best characters for Rolling Stock and Off-Rail characters respectively. The latter especially, if Free the Roads is anything to go by. Oh, and for the record, I'm not counting Flying Scotsman since he was more of a prop rather than a character back then. Same with City of Truro. There is a pretty big production gap between Series 2 and 3 by about 5 years, most likely due to Britt Allcroft and Rick Sigelko working on Shiny Time Station, and David Mitten and Robert D. Cardana on Tugs, the latter of which was also being produced by Clearwater Features before it closed down. Cardana left before the first series began and eventually worked on another Tugboat-based show, Theodore Tugboat, which was narrated by the late Denny Doherty, who was part of another band in the 60s, The Mamas and the Papas. Doesn't that sound familiar? Although Series 3 officially aired on British television in 1992, it had technically been released first on VHS in the United Kingdom and on Shine Time Station in America, both in November 1991, with the final 10 episodes eventually coming out the following year and another year for Shine Time Station. When the first 16 episodes were released in the United Kingdom on the Time for Trouble and Trust Thomas VHS tapes, they each had different narrations provided by Michael Angelis before he re-recorded them to fit with the final 10 episodes. Another way you can tell that the production had been spread over a couple of years is how Thomas looked. Up to Trust Thomas, he had lining on the rear of his bunker, but from all up to the onward up to series 18, the lining was gone before being reinstated and the adventure begins. I don't know why it was removed, but it was probably due to Thomas's model being damaged at some point and needing repairs. Another curiosity is Tim of Shed suddenly gaining three extra births and Oliver owns up, Percy James and the Fruitful Day, and Thomas and Percy's Christmas Adventure, yet in Henry's Forest, there were six normal births, and that also applies to exterior shots as seen in Escape and Buzz Buzz. Is Tidbip Sheds really a TARDIS for locomotives? The last idea I'd like to bring up is the fact that Thomas and Percy's Christmas Adventure had been re-edited, rather poorly, into a Thanksgiving-themed story and replaced Christmas in the title with Mountain. I say it was poorly edited because... well, I think I better show you. Well done, Percy! Well done, Thomas! cheered the villagers. Percy, I've just remembered. Your mail train is still back at the siding, isn't it? Percy hurried back to fetch it. From the three-minute mark onward, as seen in the American VHS Percy's Ghostly Trick, the sound effects and music are horribly out of sync, and it becomes even more jarring on releases like Thomas's Christmas Wonderland, where the original footage is presented, but the narration doesn't match the visuals. Well done, Percy! Well done, Thomas! cheered the villagers. Percy, I've just remembered. Your mail train is still back at the siding, isn't it? Percy hurried back to fetch it. Let's remind ourselves how it went in the UK dub, shall we? Well done, Percy! Well done, Thomas! cheered the villagers. You're the best Santa Claus this village has ever had! What's a Santa Claus? asked Percy. Santa Claus is someone who drops presents down chimneys at Christmas time. Percy looked at his funnel. I wonder if... No, laughed Thomas. Chimneys, Percy, not funnels. Which reminds me, your post train is still back in the siding, isn't it? Percy hurried back to fetch it. 
The reason America ended up losing a great Christmas story was because Shine Time Station had a Thanksgiving themed episode called Billy's Party. But why the sloppy editing? Couldn't they have saved it for a Christmas episode or another episode about being kind and thankful? Coming from a woman who said the missing coach would confuse children, her plot holes sure do a good job of doing that. But at least she didn't refer to Christmas as a winter holidays, but more on that later. For all the problems I've had with Series 3, it sounds like I've been critical, but I do think it's a really good series overall. Not as amazing as Series 2, but I do prefer it to the first. It's the most colorful series thus far, and it really broke new ground for the show. After coming out in America and Japan, House Thinking and Friends had become a worldwide phenomenon, although not without consequences such as the show impacting Christopher Audrey's books, and it more or less sowed the seeds for what we would eventually get more than 25 years later. Wait, hold on. I forgot to talk about Thomas in Japan. What the fuck? Okay, first off, I want to apologize for something I missed out on in the previous episode. In 1990, Thomas was first broadcast in Japan following the success of the first two series. What made the franchise a huge success there was how prevalent railways were in everyday life, and was the first foreign dot to include individual voice actors, being narrated by Leo Morimoto and starring Keiko Toda as Thomas himself. Thomas was so big in Japan that it spawned a few specials exclusive to that country, such as Thomas in the UK trip, a crossover with Punkiki that it included exclusively filmed footage alongside Series 3, some video games, and a lot of merchandise that's hard to find unless you look for a good price on eBay. Heck, even before the show was created, Wilbur Autry's books were also translated into Japanese in 1973. No love for Christopher's books, apparently. Whew! Now that that's out of the way, let's move on to Series 4, shall we? By the start of the 1990s, Thomas Mania had reached its peak worldwide, but not all was well within. Because of the success of the TV series, this had an impact on the Railway series and Christopher Audrey's writing, being forced to write books that focused heavily on Thomas, such as Thomas and the Great Railway Show. No, 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 that's, that's too early. We're not even there yet. Fair. That's better. A book that featured Thomas leaving Soder to visit the National Railway Museum, representing the Northwestern Railway. The follow-up book, Thomas Comes Home, focused upon what happened back on his branch line while Thomas was away, but he wouldn't appear until the last illustration of the book. And then, when Christopher tried to get Barry the Rescue Engine published, he was rejected by Egmont, and instead, he was forced to write Thomas and the Fat Controller's Engines, only including Thomas's name as a marketing ploy. Ironically, when Christopher's books went out of print, that was the hardest to find. Another reason for Barry's book being rejected was because young fans wanted Thomas and his friends, not any more new engines. Yet that didn't stop the introduction of Pip and Emma in the books. Because of Thomas's fame, characters like Oliver and Bear were relegated to the sidelines, so who knows what Christopher might have done with him had Egmont not forced him to include too much Thomas. And that's another attitude that isn't changing as of 2020. As Wilbert Audrey once put it, They're so obsessed with the popularity of Thomas that they have what I can only call crane-shunted Thomas to all sorts of unlikely places in order to get him into or force him into a particular story, whether the story was written with Thomas in mind or not. Which brings me on to Series 4 itself. Like Series 3 prior, it was released first on VHS in the United Kingdom with the first 11 episodes, excluding You Can't Win, Mortal Engines, and Peter Sam and the Refreshment Lady, having a few differences in narration, as well as some music cues and sound effects being removed. Michelangelo's could be heard inhaling while recording his narration, but for later releases, it was edited out to provide a more polished product. Series 4 was the first to introduce the Scarloy Railway and its first seven engines. Scarloy, Reneus, Sir Handel, Peter Sam, Rusty, Duncan, and Duke. The first 15 episodes focused exclusively on them, but... So much for making the characters familiar with American audiences, because Bert Alcroft really oversaturated their presence. It's not that I have anything against the characters, but wouldn't it have made better sense to have three or four at a time, with standard gauge episodes in between? That's where I feel series 22 to 24 succeed in that area, providing a balance by switching between Soder-based stories and international stories. If they had the international episodes all in one go, I'm sure fans would have gotten sick of them, perhaps more than they already were, and just want to see how things are going on Sodor. The adaptations are... how can I put this delicately? 
loose. And by loose, I mean they were adapted out of order, such as the stories from Duke the Lost Engine being adapted first rather than last, and with Sleeping Beauty being adapted as the second story rather than the fourth. I go into fuller details regarding the episodes being produced and aired out of the original very series order, but Duke making cameos in episodes where he's supposed to be buried alive in the shed is just the tip of the iceberg. For the Legends, the book, not the episode, was butchered so horribly. Scully remembers and Old Faithful were mashed together to form For the Legends, the episode, not the book. But it just doesn't work and it shows. The coaches hates her handle for no reason. Edward sent to the works for no reason. Even if it took place after Old Iron, it's still a continuity nightmare since we see Duck, Douglas, and Oliver making cameos. And it's never even said if Scarlet had been sent away to be repaired outside of Sodor. A bad day for Sir Handel, however, is an even worse offender since we're introduced to the first four Scarlovy engines again, and having an air after four little engines just makes the continuity a bigger mess than it is. <sighs> yeah, this is going to be a recurring complaint throughout this review. And remember, these decisions were made by a woman who thought the missing coach would confuse children. Peter Sam and the Refreshment Lady was a pretty faithful adaptation, as were the adaptations from Little Old Engine and Gallant Old Engine. Although in the latter case, prior to the episode of the same name, we've seen Renaissance in the background when he's supposed to be at the works dare I mention. But then we come to the most infamous episode of the series, probably one of the most infamous of the classic series as a whole, Rusty to the Rescue. And I'm sorry to say this, because I'm about to piss off a lot of fans, but this episode is the absolute worst of the entire show. Not because of the overall production quality, but for what it represents. It shows that Brad Alcroft does not give the slightest damn about what Audrey created 50 years ago. Episodes down the road that are also hated by fans, Middle Engine, Renaissance and the Dinosaur, Edward Strikes Out, Don't Go back, Fiery Flynn, Soto Surprise Date, The Other Side of the Mountain, Apology Impossible, the list goes on. None of them have a patch on Rusty to the Rescue. Oh, that hot take is not gonna make me any friends. You're damn right it won't! <laughs> Anyone who claims that those crappy episodes, along with Wonky Whistle and Forever and Fucking Ever, are better than Rusty to the Rescue is an enemy of mine. Zack, that was my first episode of the whole show, and the episode which made Rusty my favorite narrow gauge engine as a kid. How dare you say something as harsh as that, comparing that to the awful CGI episodes, hit middle era episodes, and middle engine. Rusty's the rescue, unlike those episodes. No one was written out of character, Rusty's heart was in the right place, and the plot wasn't stupid and fits in with what we already know about the show. Well, I would still say that Peter Sam and the Refreshment Lady was the first episode of season 4 that I approached, but I'll get more into that later when I- Cameron, what the hell are you doing here? What? I thought everyone here was showing their thoughts on series 4. <sighs> no! We're gonna teach Zack a lesson for even thinking that Rusty to Rescue is the worst episode of the show, when it's not even close, much less even saying that. Guys, calm down. I'm sure Zack has a perfectly good explanation for why he hates Rusty to the Rescue, so let's hear him out, okay? <sighs> Thank you, Mike. It had better be a good reason, because I've heard enough people say that the original is better just because it's the original, without any other claims to back this up. Let's just listen to Zack, and then maybe that will give you time to piece together what you want to say. Sound good? Okay, Mike. Okie dokie, Mike. Fine. But just remember, this isn't over, Zack. I'll deal with you once you finish this review. Alright, so where do I begin with this? In real life, the Blue Bear Railway is a heritage railway based in Sussex in England, and was the first preserved standard gauge steam operated railway in the world. Their first engine was an ex-London Brighton and South Coast Railway A1X Class Terrier No. 55, given the name Stepney. Stepney was built in 1875, rebuilt in 1912, and arrived on the Blue Bell in 1960, eventually landing in the railway series three years later. For Bert Alcroft's vision of the show, the Blue Bell is a branch line on so that got its name because it's surrounded by bluebells and runs alongside the Scarlowy Railway, which kind of makes the role of the Scarlowy Railway redundant, but that's neither here nor there, and Stephanie is a Sodor resident. Look, I get that Britt Alcroft wanted Sodor to feel more like a universal place, but that doesn't mean I agree with her decision. If a child in the 90s can understand some cultures beyond America, then sure they can learn something about British culture. People say she understood the franchise better than Mattel is doing right now, but even in 1995, I don't think she did once Thomas's popularity grew, and to be honest, I kind of blame Shining Time Station for that. Also, I don't have full evidence to prove it, but from what I've read, Bert Alcroft made an attempt, and a frankly stupid one at that, to sue the Bluebell Railway for infringing on Stepney's television counterpart, despite the fact that he was built in the 19th century. And this was after Audrey died, by the way. She then tried the same tactic on the Tally Clean Railway, despite Audrey approving of them dressing up their engines like their Scarlowy counterparts, and the Neen Valley Railway, despite Audrey naming 
Lightning wanted their locomotives Thomas in 1971, and yet people still say she understood the franchise? If that's the case, then I hate to imagine what people say about George Lucas being the only person who understood Star Wars. If I was to draw parallels between Thomas and Star Wars, then Brits attempted lawsuits against the aforementioned railways to try and gain the money they don't owe her is the equivalent to Greedo shooting first. What's all that got to do with Rusty to the rescue? Well, Audrey based his stories off of real life events and depicted Stephanie's backstory with tact and grace. This episode is the antithesis of what Audrey envisioned and, along with Magic Railroad, proves just how little Britt Allcroft really cared about the franchise. And yes, I'd rather watch any episode from the Big World Big Adventures era over this four and a half minute turd, and that's not an exaggeration or a joke. And we're not even a quarter of the way through this marathon. I just find it pathetic that people get upset with Mattel screwing up their handling of the franchise, yet despite Brit's misguided actions, people give her a free pass because she developed the show in the first place? Okay, maybe that's not the reason, but even if it were, it's not a very good one. Anyway, on to the rest of the episodes of Series 4. After the Scarlovic stories, Quali takes a nosedive and never fully recovers. I've already gone in depth with Rusty to the rescue, but what about the rest of the Stepney saga? Thomas and Stepney is an okay merger between Bluebells of England and Stepney Special. Not much else to say here, apart from the fact that Sparky Thomas gets jealous of, dislikes another engine cliche, Train stops playing and bowled out with pretty solid overall. And then we come to the last eight episodes of the series, which just makes series four more of a continuity nightmare than it really is. Henry and the Elephant came 11 years too late and they probably shouldn't have bothered adapting it for television. Bullseyes and Toad Stands By, while not bad adaptations overall, could have been used in series two and three respectively, with the latter being swapped out for Bulgy and the former probably replacing a Christopher story. Thomas and the Special Letter was a pretty good way to celebrate the 100th episode of the show and it helps that the original story, The Fat Controller's Engines, wasn't really connected to the hours in the A famous engines, so it works well as a standalone. Paint Pots and Queens, however, is the worst of the leftovers. This should have been adapted back in series one, and maybe have Thomas's Christmas party be a standalone mini special. Heck, it even references off the rails and down the mine for goodness sake, and yet Duck and Donald are spotted in the background. I've criticized continuity throughout series four, and this episode is the worst offender of the bunch. It wouldn't have been so bad if they took liberties like they did in series three, but if they couldn't, then what's the point? Even even though the video's been unlisted, Big Engine's 87 goes into greater detail about Pink Pots and Queens being a mess of an adaptation. The last three episodes were all written by Christopher Audrey. Fish, Special Attraction, which mashed up Toby's Seaside Holiday and Bolstrode, and Mind That Bike. All of them are fine adaptations, although the first half of Special Attraction was just filler. Not much else to say on that. Overall, the episode quality for Series 4 was a step down from the previous free, and the continuity being all screwed up didn't help matters. The model work is some of the best of the entire series especially with how they made the original narrow gauge models to work around the existing standard gauge models. But sadly, Peter Eve's models for the Scarlet engines were extremely problematic to work with, especially with their side rods being sourced from old double O scale triangle models modified to slightly fit. This caused the models to run badly behind the scenes, and there was no way to fit a smoke mechanism or the battery and receiver needed for the remote control eyes, so they had to be hidden if the eyes were going to move. This eventually resulted in large scale models being made starting with Series 5, and would continue to be used for the rest of the model era with the exception of Series 8. Starting with Series 3, songs for the show began to be composed by Michael O'Donnell and Junior Campbell, beginning with Thomas We Love You, or Thomas's Anthem if you're going by the American title. Along with Thomas's Anthem, more music videos were made alongside the fourth series, having previously been composed for the audiobook story, Thomas and the Best Kept Station Competition, with two exceptions being That's What Friends Are For and Rules and Regulations. Michael O'Donnell said that music videos for both had been made, but for whatever reason, they'd never been released. In the case of the former, it was because the song was too sad for the overall tone of the the show. The official music videos we have now for them contain CGI footage, although the songs were edited down. Wouldn't it be nice to get the original music videos with model footage? There are some recreations online, but we can only dream about what the official versions were like. Series 4 was the last to have narration from George Carlin, who then went on to resume his comedy career, while Michelangelo's would carry on up to Series 16. And finally, I made the decision on who I prefer. George Carlin? or Ringo Starr. Honestly, I'm a lot more familiar with George's narration for the first two series than I am for Ringo's, so I have to choose George. Don't get me wrong, Ringo did pretty fair with them, but George's narration felt a lot more lively in my opinion, as well as giving every character their own voices. Even in the episodes I didn't like for the first four series, the one thing I can never hate is George's narration. He brought forth his A-game for every episode he narrated, and to great shame that he's no longer with us, so thanks George for providing me and many of our American fans with so 
many great childhood memories, you'll never be forgotten. Series 4 overall hasn't aged very well. Visually it's beautiful, but they're sadly let down by poor writing decisions and sloppy continuity. That being said, I can understand why people would love it after many years. The music is some of the best of the show, and the model work is fantastic, and the narration by Angelus and Carlin for both sides of the Atlantic still hold up to this day. So far it's my least favorite of the classic era, but it is a series that I respect a lot more than I love these days. It's an okay series overall, but as one era comes to a close, another one begins. And I better hide until the next episode just so I don't get attacked with what I said about a certain episode. TTFN! Nineteen ninety six marked the end of a couple of eras for Thomas the Tank Engine. The last railway series book at the time, New Little Engines, was published, bringing the total number of books to forty. It introduced the seventh engine of the Scarloway Railway, Ivo Hugh, and apparently there may have been plans to expand upon his character in the future books, but because he only appeared in the last story I named this engine, and the next two books focused heavily on Thomas despite barely appearing in either of them, that didn't happen. Christopher Rodri is said to have written more stories about the Scarloway engine but details have yet to be fully revealed. Speaking of which, the actual planned follow-up book, Thomas and Victoria, was going to be published in 1997, but then, tragedy struck. On June 15th, 1997, Wilbur Audrey died from illness at the age of 85. He had been awarded an Order of the British Empire the year before, but he was unable to travel due to his declining health. After his death, Britt Allcroft bought the rights to the railway series from William Heinemann, the main reason that Thomas and Victoria had been held back for 10 years. Egmont Publishing had intended to continue the series with a format change, but because it flopped critically, the books were discontinued altogether. The other era to come to an end, well, almost, was Shining Time Station, with a mini spin-off series called Mr. Conductor's Thomas Tales, featuring stories that weren't shown in any of the free seasons of the show or the hour-long specials, mostly from Series 4, along with the occasional revisit of a previous episode. Daisy and Percy's Predicament were excluded for unknown reasons, remaining as VHS-exclusive episodes. Five stories were connected to what was happening in a day of Mr. Conductor's life, before ending the episode with a song by Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell. It was the last time George Carlin had any involvement with Thomas the Tank Engine, although he would continue to talk fondly of his time with the show until his death in 2008. They came to me and the reason I took it was I still, there's that acting thing over here looking at me. I thought, well, I'll show another side of myself. I'll show a side that no one's expecting. And the Mr. Conductor was complete departure from anything anyone would have expected from me judging me by my persona on stage. While Michael Angelus would carry on for the United Kingdom, the United States had big shoes to fill for its narrator, probably bigger than those left behind by Ringo. Enter everyone's favorite Donald Trump impersonator, Alec Baldwin. While working on the casting for Magic Railroad, Britt needed a new actor to fill in Carlin's shoes as the new Mr. Conductor. Peter Fonda, who was playing Burnett Stone, suggested Baldwin, who at this point was already making a name for himself, starring in such Hollywood movies such as Beetlejuice, The Hunt for Red October, and Glengarry Glen Ross. Try saying it five times fast. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. A lot of people tend to give Alec Baldwin some flack. Of all I can't say, it's not unjustified. Wait, hold on. That's a triple negative. I'm practically saying it's not justified. And while I can't say it's unjustified, to Alex's credit, when he's good, he's pretty damn good. Though children's media probably wasn't the best choice for him to perform. He'll never be George Carlin. Not in a million years, but he wasn't too bad during Series 5, I'll admit, and here, he did at least try to give the engines their own distinct voices, though James has made the red engine sound like he was gay, according to an episode of Late Night with Conan O'Brien. There's this tank engine called James. James. And, yeah, and, <laughs> and clearly you made James gay. That's your interpretation. <laughs> Suddenly, he saw James pulling a long, slow train. Oh my goodness! Help! Save me! A quick-thinking shunter did, just in time. What was that? exclaimed James. Surely James isn't hiding something. Considering Baldwin's voice for him and the type of character that he is, is it possible that he might, in fact, be gay? 
Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, of course not. But with that said, it's still more effort than he put into Series 6, which we'll cover next time. On the other side of the Atlantic, Michelangelo's narration was as good as ever, and over time, James began to develop a Liverpudlian accent that would be carried over for the remainder of the model series, and I believe it was intended to be his voice for Thomas and the Magic Railroad. Speaking of that movie, for the first time, the show did not rely on any Audrey written material, sticking solely to original material by Britt Allcroft and David Mitten, along with a few episodes based on magazine stories by Andrew Brenner. For almost half of the series, David Maidman served as a railway consultant when it came to the stories, one of the most notable being A Better View for Gordon, which was inspired by a railway accident from 1895 that had taken place in Paris, France. Others, such as Ba, were inspired by incidents that Maven had experienced during his career on British Railways, in which he was a station master at Aberdeeg, where a ram occupied the abandoned station of Lanhilef. I hope I pronounced that right. This was Maidman's only series as a railway consultant, and while he desired to return to the show and Britt Allcroft sold her company to Hit Entertainment, he got no response. But at least he received a 10 grand donation to the railway children for his work. One of the reasons Britt went for a full series of original stories was because she had this desire to create a theatrical film based around Thomas the Tank Engine and wanted David Bitten to show off his modeling skills. This seemed like a good idea in theory, but the execution of the final product ended up being a disaster and flopped hard to the box office, forcing her to step down from her position. But what about the episodes themselves? Well, to say that they were hit or miss would be an understatement. Unlike Series 4, however, which had very sloppy continuity, continuity is a bit tighter here in Series 5, and even expands a little upon Oliver and Toad, two characters who hardly got any focus in the books after Oliver the Western Engine in 1969, and even dedicated an episode to Stepney of all characters, apparently being established as a permanent resident on Sodor rather than a one-time visitor. But anyway, the series took on darker and edgier plot lines that contained a lot more intense actions and crashes. Many of the crashes involved were stupid, others were pointless, and then there's some that were just outright bonkers. Case in point. Gordon running into the last truck on Duck's train at full speed, and then the truck flies into the air and smashes to pieces when it hits the ground in By George. It's honestly very hypocritical of fans to say that Big World Big Adventures was unrealistic, yet Series 5 had loads of moments like these, and they get a free pass because... Anti-Mattel bias? Now, I imagine that those who like this series will go stabbing their keyboards, getting pissed off with me because I criticize something they love since childhood, but hear me out. Yes, while Audrey intended for his stories to be grounded in reality, that was never the main focus of the stories to begin with. No. What he focused on instead was that the engines learned something following a mishap and to try and avoid those mistakes in the future. That's the point in literally every kid's show, to teach them good, solid life lessons, and Thomas should be of no exception. Heck, if this series is anything to go by, it shouldn't. If realism was the main focus of the show, then the engines wouldn't have faces to begin with. You'd have a railway documentary instead, and that wouldn't be anywhere near as entertaining. Also, if realism really was a factor in the earlier series, then Thomas wouldn't have gone on the main line pulling a long goods train in Thomas and the Trucks, because in real life, the E2 tank engines were inadequate for long distance running and were only suitable for shunting on the south coast of England in areas like Brighton and Southampton. But even then, the E2s were outclassed by other tank engines with a similar purpose, and despite Thomas himself being an E2, they were all withdrawn and scrapped by the mid-1960s, with Thomas being the sole reason that they're even remembered. Also, if we again factor in realism, Thomas would be painted black instead of blue, a livery that none of the E2s ever wore. I know I'm going on a bit there, and that it will also piss off certain people, but my point is that fans can't cherry pick what should and shouldn't be to find out what Thomas is and isn't. All I ask is for a little more consistency, people. Otherwise, we find ourselves culpable of a double standard, and it is my understanding that those are bad. Now let's talk about the newbies for Series 5. Barring last series Smudger, who was created just to avoid wasting money on a one-off model that would likely never be used again, Series 5 was the first to introduce non-Audrey characters, if we exclude the background humans. These being in order, Cranky the Crane, the Horrid Lorries, Butch the Breakdown Vehicle, Dowager Hat, Derek the Diesel, Ari and Bert, Bertram the Old Warrior, Old Slowcoach, and Fumper the... Digging Machine? Again, 
Excluding one-off human characters, that's about 12 total, and most of them only appeared in this series, with Cranky, Butch, Harry, Bert, and Dowager Hat all eventually making their way into CGI. Probably the most useless out of the newbies were Fubber, who's practically a more plot device than character, and Bertram, who's just a repainted Duke with Smudger's face, and neither of them said a damn thing. How can we feel for someone who says nothing and has no personality? Unless the character is mute and struggles in expressing themselves, then maybe we can feel something for them, but come on! Bertram didn't even appear for 20 seconds. At least Duke's model got reverted at some point down the line. Maybe those who didn't appear in future series were actually intended to appear for Series 6, most notably Derek and Old Slowcoach, but I feel it's a shame that neither were capitalized upon nor even considered for CGI. I think they could have fit right in. Derek so we could add in a few bigger diesels to the railway, and Old Slowcoach to add a bit more variety and rolling stock. Heck, maybe have the horrid lorries make a reappearance and having them constantly try to undermine the railways. There's a lot you could do with them. Instead... We got nothing, except for Derek briefly reappearing in a music video and calling all engines. And this mentality would later plant a dangerous seed that series 9 through 16 would be criticized for, characters being made for the sake of merchandising and nothing else. Series 5 had a big part in the Thomas franchise. It took on risks for sure, but not all of them were for the best. If anything, this series played a role in the downfall of the franchise and never fully recovered from it. Unrealistic moments that were sometimes taken to ludicrous levels, characters introduced for the sake of merchandising, overabundance of crashes, etc, etc, and it would all come crashing down for Bert Alcroft when the Magic Railroad flopped hard to the box office, practically turning the franchise into a joke, resulting in her leaving by the start of the new millennium. Series 5 is an okay series, but saying it's one of the best of the show, or maybe even the best overall, I feel that's greatly exaggerated. Like Series 4 prior, there have been better series before and since. And now for something completely different. He veered out of control, and Sir Topham Hatt landed in a muddy ditch close to where Thomas was taking on water. Bother! Bother! There is a fair bit going on behind the scenes between the airings of series 5 and 6. Bert Alcroft was working on what would be her biggest mistake, Thomas and the Magic Railroad, and after a negative test audience reaction forced her to make changes, mere weeks before it was to premiere, the film opened to negative reviews and bombed hard at the box office, currently having a 21% critic approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Due to the film's failure, Alcroft was forced to step down from her role as director of Ghislaine Entertainment, and her role was reduced to executive producer. Had the leaked work print in completed form been released instead, I could imagine the film getting far worse reviews due to even less focus on Thomas. But I digress. Meanwhile, David Mitten stayed on as director for the series, barring two episodes, and also took on the role of script consultant, bringing in talents such as Brian Truman and his son Jonathan, Paul Larson, Abby Grant, Simon Nicholson, Ross Hastings, James Mason, and Jenny McDade. Magic Railroad producer Phil Farrell began work on what was to be the first Thomas and Tank Engine spin-off, Jack in the Pack, being directed by production veteran Steve Asquith, who also directed two episodes for Series 6, Jack Jumps In and A Friend in Need. 26 episodes were planned, but because of financial difficulties and the acquisition of Hit Entertainment, as well as wanting to avoid competition with Bob the Builder, the spin-off was cancelled with only 13 episodes filmed before they were eventually released on DVD in 2006. And in case anyone is wondering, no, I won't be reviewing the pack episodes, at least not right now. I want to focus solely on the main series itself, so let's get back to series 6. Compared to the last series that focused purely on action and crashes, though not for every episode, series 6 focused a lot more on the storytelling and characters. It's a lot more laid back than series 5, but every once in a while, it wasn't afraid to have some action on display. Oh, help, Gordon cried as he slid off the tracks. And into a field. <laughs> 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 
With that being said, the cast of characters from the first five series had been noticeably cut down, presumably due to the influx of newbies in series five. Like I said in the previous review, I suspect that old slow coach and Derek were planned for series six, but because of Magic Road's failure and Brit stepping away from the writing staff, that never happened. And am I right in saying Diesel 10 was also planned for an episode or two? I think he could have worked a lot better in Devious Diesel's place in the world's strongest engine, since it was said that Henry had an accident and needed a substitute. But Diesel was instead sent to the docks, and why was it said that he might have been a proper dockyard Diesel when we already had Salty? I just felt confused having written that. Just have Diesel 10 substitute for Henry on goods trains, and he resents the duty, wanting to take passengers instead. As it is, we had to wait through 11 series, which we'll cover soon enough, along with a switch to CGI in between, before he actually appeared in an episode. <laughs> Never mind about Sydney. We need some more decorations, and I know just the place to get them. And even ignoring that, he had a small role in calling our engines, and an even bigger role in Day of the Diesels. Again, not covering those specials right now, just thought I'd bring them up. The new characters introduced for Series 6, the pack notwithstanding, were Salty the Dockside Diesel, Harvey the Crane Engine, and Elizabeth the Old Steam Lorry. That would be Vintage Sentinel Lorry. Right, sorry. Vintage Sentinel Lorry. Anyway, while Salty and Harvey would eventually make their way into CGI, with the former being established as the leader of Brendam Docks, and the latter getting some good development in the likes of Gone Fishing, I think Elizabeth would have made a fantastic addition to the series. Given how many nice female characters we had in the show, I think someone as blunt and straightforward as Elizabeth could really have shaken things up. Not just for female characters, but for the roads as well. Also, she was said to have a history with Sir Topham Hatt that hasn't been elaborated upon since her debut, so why not give them an episode in the CGI? I can only imagine what they would have done with Elizabeth if she had returned to the show. And as for the pack, at least, those who appeared in Jack Jumps In and A Friend in Need, I think the idea of a spin-off to Thomas the Tank Engine, one that was still actually based around the world of Sodor, of course, was a good idea. In fact, I may have heard somewhere that there was going to be one based around the likes of Birdie and Harold that would eventually evolve into one being about the pack. But with what we got, I think we can be happy. They had a great introduction to two-parter, and we get glimpses of their individual personalities. Jack being the eager newbie, Max being an arrogant bully, Ned being clumsy but cheerful, Kelly being the leader, etc. So overall, Series 6 had a great selection of newbies, most of whom have ended up in the CGI series in some capacity. So what can be said in regards to production? Well, for America, this was Alec Baldwin's last series as narrator, and... Oh boy. His narration had taken a huge nosedive since Series 5. He just sounds forced and uninterested. Let's note a few examples, shall we? Hurry up, hurry up, chuffed Gordon crossly. Why the rush, Gordon? asked Thomas. If I must pull freight cars, then I'll show Salty how an express engine pulls freight cars, Gordon huffed. Hello, J -j 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 James, muttered Percy icily. Scary Jack Frost, cried James, and he raced away as fast as his wheels could carry him. He didn't stop until he got back to the sheds. He didn't even bother giving Donald and Douglas their trademark Scottish accents. Stop being pushy, Donald snapped. Don't call me pushy, Douglas snapped back. You shouldn't have pushed me into the cart, huffed Donald. You pulled me, you mean, argued Douglas. Didn't. Did. Did not. Did too. Now compare them to the UK dub. Hurry up, hurry up, chuffed Gordon crossly. Why the rush, Gordon? asked Thomas. If I must pull trucks, then I'll show Salty how an express engine pulls trucks, Gordon huffed. Hello, J J James, muttered Percy icily. Scary Jack Frost, cried James, and he raced away as fast as his wheels could carry him. He didn't stop until he got back to the sheds. Stop being pushy, Donald snapped. Don't call me pushy, Douglas snapped back. You shouldn't have pushed me into the cart, huffed Donald. You pulled me, you mean, argued Douglas. Didn't he? Did. Did, no. Did, too. Seriously, Alec, what the heck happened there? Especially since last series, we did have gems like this. Help! Called the engines from inside the shed. I can't! Called Cranky. And now we're reduced to bits like this. Scary Jack Frost, cried James. Maybe it was because of the failure of Magic Girl that he was lacking enthusiasm, 
Or it could be because at the time he was going through a nasty divorce with Kim Basinger. It's one or both of him, but either way, after this series, he left to carry on with his acting career, and while America was looking for a new narrator, Michael Angelis narrated a few episodes of Series 7 for them, which we'll cover in the next episode. Somehow, children's material just didn't work for Alec Baldwin. At the very least, he did get a good role in the first Spongebob movie. I got you right where I want you. Uh, can I help you with something, sir? Name's Dennis. I've been hired to exterminate you. But when it comes to the likes of Cat in the Hat, well... Let's just say there's a reason most products based on Dr. Seuss's stories since then were animated. I'd like to point out that the Cat in the Hat movie is actually a guilty pleasure of mine. It's not very good, but I can never really hate it. There was also that one role that I remember Alec Baldwin has done. He voices Butch from the 2001 film Cats and Dogs with Tobey Maguire as Lou. Hey, can we not bring up non-Thomas projects in this? We're gonna get sidetracked if we do. And I just made a painfully obvious pun there. Oh yeah, you did. Sorry, Zach. Just thought it would be worth mentioning. Anyway, Baldwin was later replaced by Michael Brandon, who I'll talk about more in the next episode. Brandon also re-narrated six episodes from this series for PBS when they aired alongside Series 9, with recomposed music by Robert Harshorn. This was the same story for Michael Angelus in the UK, but for Nick Jr. As usual, Angelus does a solid job with the narration. Not much else to say here. Series 6 was the first to be filmed in 16.9 widescreen as opposed to far free full screen from the first five series prior. Growing up in America, I got the new episodes in full screen on DVD, at least until Spills and Frills in 2014, when they started to release them in their proper widescreen resolution. Parts of the first six episodes were filmed in full screen, but later added to widescreen, with scenes based around Tedbiff Sheds, the Seaside Village, Tedbiff Beach, and the church being filmed in widescreen. I mean, just look at the galleries for those episodes and you'll see what I mean. You'd never know just by watching the episodes. I guess the scenes in 4 Free Full Screen were those that were first to be filmed before they decided to switch over to 16.9 widescreen. Anyone got an idea as to why that decision was made? Answers on a postcard, please. For an additional bit of behind the scenes, the original small scale models for the Scarlet engines were going to be used, but they were left in storage in favor of the more reliable large scale models, with the exception of Scarlet's original model appearing in the series 10 episode, Thomas and Scarlet's Big Day Out. That meant Sir Handel had to wait for four more series before he actually returned to the show, but Duke never reappeared in the model series outside of stock footage, nor was he even considered for CGI. Heaven forbid if he were to appear in a 2D reboot. That would never suit his grace. From what I have read, people have said the writing for Series 6 is weaker than the first five. But I wouldn't go so far as to say it's the weakest of the classic series. To me, that distinction goes to Series 4 just for how all over the place the continuity is. Continuity with Series 6 is stronger, but that's not to say it's perfect. For example, in Rusty Saves the Day, so Topham Hack closes down the Scarlory Railway, but not the quarry for whatever reason, because it takes too much of Rusty's time just to keep it serviceable. I thought Sir Topham Hat was all in favor of preservation and that being the Scarlory Railway's maintenance diesel was supposed to be Rusty's job. It just feels as though a lot of Sodor's history was rewritten for the sake of the story, and that's a problem that comes and goes until Series 17. However, when the writing for Series 6 is good, it's really good. A bit like Christopher Audrey's books, in fact, and the same can be said for Series 7, which, again, I'll get to. I could name a lot of good episodes from this series. The Pack 2 Parter, James and the Red Balloon, Hershey's Chocolate Crunch, Harvey to the Rescue, Gordon Takes a Tumble, and yes, Thomas the Jet Engine, an episode you either love or hate for the exact same reason. Loads of suspension of disbelief in regards to the laws of reality, but so entertaining you can't help but enjoy it, especially with little gems like this. Want to race, Thomas? Beat Bertie? Never mind. However, I wouldn't put Jet Engine in my top 10 episodes overall for that era, but as an honorable mention, maybe. On an interesting note, we did get a railway series adaptation, well, sort of, in the form of Faulty Whistles, the series finale, loosely based upon Mike's whistle, but with Peter, Sam, and Duncan taking on the roles of Duck and Mike. 
respectively. I won't get into too much detail before we get to series 20, but for now, I will say that it's an alright adaptation, but doesn't really hold a candle to the original story, and especially not the CGI adaptation. But of course, series 6 isn't without its duds, most infamously being Metal Engine, which may as well be the Thomas equivalent to My Little Pony's Newbie Dash, an episode where our main character, Percy and Rainbow Dash respectively, gets tormented for no reason other than for the sake of the story, and presumably because the writers think Kafka comes is funny. Basically, Fig stressed Eric with Percy in Eric's place, you get middle engine. Thomas 1 Edward 2 Henry Free goes into great detail about why that episode is his personal worst of the classic series, but where does that episode land in my list for worst classic series episodes? I've already said that Rusty to the Rescue is my personal worst in that era, so middle engine is a close second. I'll get to my top 10 best and worst for the classic era when, again, I finished up series 7. This also applies to the next four eras to come, and I imagine that my choices will be interesting to say the least. Series 6 has probably not aged for me as well as I like to think, but honestly, I can never really bring myself to hate it. I was 7 years old, later 8, when Series 6 first came out on DVD in America, so I have a bit of a nostalgic connection to it, even if Alec Baldwin's narration sucked donkey ass. But with Michelangelo's narration, I can appreciate it a lot more. I go so far as to say this series is a bit underrated, even though I get it's not going to be for everyone. But come this Christmas, we come to the end of the classic era, and the gateway to an era despised by many fans. The Hit Era Henson International Productions, more commonly known as Hit Entertainment, was originally established in 1982 by Jim Henson, yes, that Jim Henson, as the international distribution arm of Jim Henson Productions. Through HIT, they were able to co-produce Henson's latest project at the time, Fraggle Rock, in London alongside the now-defunct Television South. Fast forward 20 years later, and HIT Entertainment had acquired the rights to Thomas' Tank Engine brand, with the intent on making it more... Let's call it kid-friendly, shall we? This meant that Series 7 would be the last for several key members of the production crew, including Britt Alcroft, now acting as creative consultant, David Mitten for his last series as director, Robert Galt Galliers as art director, and Michael O'Donnell and Junior Campbell as music composers. Although the latter two had expressed interest in returning for Series 8, they were turned away in favor of Robert Harshorn and Ed Welch. So, did those five Thomas production veterans end their time with the little blue tank engine on a high note? Well, yes and no. Obviously, Series 7 does not hold a candle to the first free series. Rewatching it, I honestly never expected it to, but it does have its own merits and can stand up on its own. Probably the first point of contention is the episode order. Just taking a look at the order on the complete Series 7 DVD from the UK, which was based upon production order, it's really messy and disorganized. For example, Emily's New Coaches is the 18th episode on the DVD, but episodes featuring her, such as What's the Matter with Henry, Oldie Rides Again, and Salty Stormy Tail all come before it. Likewise, The Spotless Record comes after Bill, Ben, and Fergus, and the former is meant to be Arthur's debut story. Meanwhile, the Australian release and any digital release of Season 7 has them in the original airing order, but even that's got its issues as well. Along with the aforementioned continuity era with The Spotless Record and Bill, Ben, and Fergus, we have Something Fishy airing before Peace and Quiet and Gordon and Spencer, Murdoch and Spencer's respective debut stories. I think that if you really want a proper viewing experience with Series 7, you have to look more carefully at the little details as to which episodes feature any of the series newbies. I think a proper order could be as follows, and I'll let you fill in the gaps from here. Or you can just watch their respective debuts first, a la new friends were Thomas, before going into the rest. Whatever works for you. And while we're on the topic of production for Series 7, this series contained a lot of stock footage from the previous six. It's very obvious since in Toby's Windmill and Bulgy Rides Again, Peter Sam has his old funnel, and in Not So Hasty Puddings, Henry's in his old shape. It's worth noting that while Series 7 was being filmed, so was Jack and the Pack spinoff, at least half of the planned episodes were, it's actually very amazing that they managed to do both at the same time as each other. For example, with A Visit from Thomas, it was filmed alongside Free Cheers for Thomas as you can see Miss Jenny at Mayfleet Station waving on the platform. Series 7 was the first season to officially feature Michael Brandon as the narrator for the American market, and he would continue this role all the way up to Series 16. Ugh, it's gonna be a long one, folks, believe me. 
But what do I think of Brandon as a narrator? Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say he was bad, per se. I think it was the writing of series 8 through 16 that didn't do him much justice. Brandon was trying to make bad stories entertaining, which is an uninevitable task for anyone to try and accomplish. To give credit where it's due, he tried, and Michael Brandon is a narrator whom I respect not only for staying as long as he did, not as long as Angelus, but still, but also for making the most of a tough situation. Then there's Michael Angelus. His narration was pretty solid overall, but compared to series 3 through 6, he had lost a bit of energy that he had in the 90s, probably due to his roles as James and Percy being taken over for Magic Railroad by Susan Roman and Linda Ballantine, respectively. <sighs> Don't get me started on James's Magic Railroad voice. You weren't concentrating, Thomas. Lucky for you that the buffers were there. I was naughty and Sir Topham Hatt told me to think about all the ways I can be really useful. Then I can come out again. Nothing against Susan Roman, but she's no Rob Rackstraw. <laughs> Wobbly wheels. I'm genuinely amazed that Angelus returned to the show despite being replaced in the movie, unlike John Bellis as the original voice for Thomas and Doug Lennox as P.T. Boomer, both of whom had an amazing opportunity that was so cruelly taken away from them. Hold up, Zach. Can I please say a few bits on what I think of Season 7? Matthew... Uh, uh, fine. Go ahead, but don't expect this to be a recurring thing. Yes! Now then. I've been waiting to say my piece about this season. Despite it being the last of the classic era, before the start of an absolutely horrible era, along with being heavy on stock footage as Zack has mentioned, I absolutely love this season! First of all, it introduced my biggest fictional character crush of all in Emily, and also a narrator for the US dub who, despite not being the best of the whole show, gave another character a really good voice to the point in many audio dramas I try to replicate it. Here's who it is. Not like that, Snap Fergus. Do it right. Don't interfere, sneered Diesel. Not anymore. Sir Topham Hatt says I'm better than you, so I'm going to stay here. <laughs> That's right, Michael Brandon's best character voice is Diesel. Now then, it's no secret that Emily's new coaches, What's the Matter with Henry, and Salty Stormy Tail each are among my top three favorite episodes from the season, and the reasons are simple. They are Emily, Emily, Emily! She was at her absolute best in those episodes, and nobody can convince me otherwise. Unless we are talking about her appearance in Tale of the Brave, since her minor role in that special was easily the finest moment for her character yet. Did I also mention I love her Season 7 theme? I didn't? Well, now you all know! Sadly, the adoration didn't last for very long, as the next season will show why I say that. Now, for the other newbies. I like Murdoch and Arthur, but Fergus... I don't really care much for him, but I don't hate him either. Spencer, on the other hand, I think he's an alright new character. I wasn't initially too big on him, but I grew to like him in the CGI era. It helps that he reminds me a bit of Seto Kaiba from Yu-Gi-Oh. Okay, Zach, I'm done. Thank you for your guest appearance. Now do me a favor and buzz off so I can do the review in peace. Anyway, as I was saying, as I said in my review for Series 3, my first exposure to Michelangelo's was through the American VHS New Friends for Thomas, in which he did four of the five introductory episodes of Series 7, as well as the pack episodes from Series 6. I liked his narration then, and I still do to this day. I then became even more familiar with his narration when Series 10 was posted on YouTube, but it was fully clear to even then that he didn't have the energy from Series 3 to 7. Angelus was a severely undervalued narrator. Most of the other narrators are A-list celebrities in their own right. Ringo Starr was part of the Beatles and had a successful solo career that lasted 50 years over 20 albums. George Carlin was a comedian, and Alec Baldwin and Pierce Brosnan are pretty big in Hollywood. Even Michael Brandon and Mark Morahan had more significance than Angelus did, which is a crying shame. Oh, and in case anyone is wondering, for the next several episodes, I won't be bringing up the narrations of the two Michaels that much, but I will say that Angela sounds a bit more tired as it progresses, and Brandon continued doing his best despite the awful writing. They got seriously overused during series 13 to 16, and I dread when the time comes that I have to revisit them. When Michael Brandon's narrations were released on VHS and DVD in America, the original music of Michael Donald and Jr. Campbell was replaced by that of Robert Harshorn, with three exceptions being Harold and the Flying Horse, Bulgy 
rides again, and Salty Stormy Tail, all from Thomas and the Jet Engine, presumably to be more consistent with the Series 6 episodes. I'm sure there's an official dub somewhere with Brainerd's narration and the original Series 7 music for every episode, but we can only dream of what might be. As explained, the music was also recomposed for a few episodes of Series 6 when Bat and the 7th were aired alongside Series 8 and 9, both for the US and the UK. In the case of Series 7, most of the episodes were given new themes by Robert Harshorn, and while Renee's and the Roller Coaster had Harshorn's score on the UK DVD Bumper Party Collection, the remaining five episodes still have the original themes by Mike and Jr., so who knows if Robert composed new music for those episodes. When it comes to writing quality, Series 7 is about the same as Series 6, although it is marginally better. I mean, I don't think there's an episode here that's downright awful like Middle Engine. There are bad episodes, of course, but they're mostly inoffensive and I can just shrug them off. There's a fair number of gems in this series like Emily's New Coaches, The Refreshment Lady's Tea Shop, Best Dressed Engine, Gordon and Spencer, and the final episode of the classic series, Free Cheers for Thomas. And what a fitting finale it was to call back to one of the best episodes of the first series as well. I hadn't seen much of Series 7 as a kid, likely due to interest in newer episodes from Series 9 and 10. Hey, I was a preteen at the time, so could you really blame me there? As an adult, I can appreciate Series 7, warts and all, and say that like Series 6 before, it's pretty underappreciated by a lot of fans, but not forgotten. So let's talk about the classic series as a whole. Was it perfect? No, there are episodes that haven't aged very well, and there are some that the more I think about, the more I dislike them, and then there's others that were better than I remember. But I wouldn't say the classic series as a whole is the best period of the show's history. I think that's a bit of an overstatement, especially since Birdall Croft made a lot of stupid decisions, mostly in the 90s, and ended up being the indirect catalyst to where the series is at right now. So the classic series as a whole is something that I respect a lot more than I love. My top 10 favorites for that era are as follows. Number 10, Escape, for its intensity and character moments. Number 9, Something in the Air, for having a classic Audrey vibe. Number 8, Thomas and the Breakdown Train, for bringing Thomas's first character arc to a fantastic close. Number 7, Fish, for having one of the best actions of the show, music and all. Number 6, James and the Red Balloon, for the sheer beauty of its music. Number 5, Gordon and Spencer, for giving Gordon a bit more depth and bringing a good character in Spencer. Number 4, Edward's Exploit, for being Pete Edward. Number 3, All at Sea, for expanding upon Dyke's character and that beautiful end shot. Number two, Ghost Train for its atmosphere and spooky vibe. And number one, Thomas and Birdie for so many iconic moments such as Thomas and Birdie's first ever race together. And now for my top ten least favorites, and I imagine that's going to be a controversial list for sure. Number ten, The Trouble with Mud for being a messy, pointless adaptation. Number nine, Rusty Saves a Day for a lack of continuity and consistency and the misleading title. Number 8, What's the Matter with Henry, for having a weak conflict and feeling mandated just to give Henry a lead role. Number 7, The Sad Story of Henry, for showing what Audrey really thought about Henry, even back then, and its lack of action. Number 6, Toby's Discovery, for marking the beginning of Toby's wimpy personality that would haunt him in the Miller era. Number 5, A Bad Day Force to Handle, for being a sloppy, disjointed adaptation and pointless reintroduction to the narrow gauge engines. Number 4, Paint Pots and Queens for coming in 11 years too late. Number 3, Snow for treating avalanches like they're a joke. Number 2, Middle Engine for feeling like a massive hate letter towards Percy. And number 1, Rusty to the Rescue for showing just how little Brett Allcroft cared about Audrey's creation. Well, that's gonna do it for 2020. Thank goodness that awful year will be coming to an end soon. I'm Zach, you're watching Sodorama. And for now, I wish you all a Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and hopes to agile hoverboards and flying cars in the future, even if they're six years late. Starting January 4th, 2021, on Mondays and Fridays, we'll be covering the remaining 17 series, starting with the first series of the hit entertainment era. I mean, sure they can't be as awful as people say it is. Right? Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, everyone.